James Bevan is here, Chief Investment Officer at CCLA Investment Management. Interesting, James, when you look at the share, Sainsbury in the last 12 months down by 21%, Tesco down by just 8%, but Sainsbury's is delivering on, on like-for-like sales, whereas you, you can tell me where the Tesco is. Well, I have to say that I'm disappointed by Tesco's recent performance. I think they're going to have a very difficult statement tomorrow. Mm. I think the market is going to be unimpressed because... Tesco has come, into the, come to the table recently and it's been very clear that the numbers are not what analysts have been hoping for. I think we have to see some news in terms not just of the like-for-like -like sales numbers, which we all know are going to be harsh, will probably be down rather than up, but also we need to know what will be happening to the store opening program. And there I think we have to see some rabbits from the hat for the share prices to go up. The, the, the discounting war ensues, doesn't it? Uh, the big price drop. Success or failure? You I'd say, say failure, failure at the moment, yeah. absolutely. Why? They roll the dice. They have not managed to excite the consumer. The consumer, as we all know, is a very fickle creature. It's very clever. They have not been excited by the Tesco proposition. And I think what's very interesting is that in the mid-90s, Tesco was the store of choice. Everybody wanted to go there. Right now, it's Asda and Aldi. People saying that's where we want to go and shop. You'll recall that Marks and Sparks equally have been in the ascendant. They've been knocked down. They're back up again. And I, I have to say that I think for the moment, Tesco is going to find it very difficult to make good share price progress. The silver lining for Tesco shareholder, of which we are one, yeah. is that we're going to be getting a 4% yeah. dividend deal. That looks really robust, and I think the scope for that dividend to be growing. So, so that's the silver lining. The best performing retail stock is, is Morrison's. But its sales weren't as good as Sainsbury's. No, that, that's right. And if one were to look at the industry writ large, it's very clear that Wait Right is the unquoted company amongst the peers is doing extremely well and they've got a fantastic proposition as far as the consumer concern and I suspect that they have taken quite a significant chunk of Tesco's normal market share. Talk to me about the consumer in Europe, James, because we're in an environment where consumers are paying off debt, governments are paying off debt. When you look at consumer-driven stocks, which ones are attractive in this environment? Well, you know, I think if you're looking at consumer stocks, you have to consider where is the growth in consumption going to come from. And I think it's emerging markets where the, where the pocketbooks are bulging with cash ready to be spent. And that's where people should be looking. They should be looking at propositions and products. I mean, you, you think of a company like Swatch, the, the, the Swiss watchmaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Luxury good, absolutely. But the sales numbers coming out of emerging markets are really very attractive. That's, I think, the sort of consumer story we should be looking at. A lot of people have gone on the bandwagon and saying United States numbers, brilliant, that's where we should be going back to. I don't think that the growth in the United States looks remotely sustainable. If you see where that growth came from, it was from re-leveraging. I think that's going to all unwind this year. What about, the US will disappoint. What about non-luxury? Because a lot of the picks would be the luxury stocks because of their exposure to Absolutely. emerging markets. What about non-luxury retail? Are there any nuggets out there with exposure to emerging markets? Well, you have to think about the Danones and the Procter yeah. & Gambles, the Heinzes, all the companies that are associated with consumer products but not actually retailing directly and there I think the valuations are actually much more attractive than the luxury goods. The problem I have with luxury goods is not the underlying thesis that these companies will deliver high profitability and strong profits growth. You do have to pay very richly to participate in that story and therefore the downside potential is now quite significant if the story unwinds. I mean the government yes has to clamp down on the on the city and impose regulation in light of what we've seen in recent years but there's a temptation to kill the golden goose isn't there? I, well, there's a risk. Well, there's no evidence that separating investment from retail banking operations will reduce risk. After all, if one were to think about it, the crises, the Lehman crisis that nearly floored the world would not have been any different if we had enacted these rules or not, because after all, it was an investment bank that went sour, but it still had systemic risks. If one thinks about Northern Rock, that was not an investment banking problem, that was a retail banking operation, that was liquidity rather than bad investments that ultimately led to its problems. And I, I think that there is a great appetite for people to jump on the bandwagon and crack the whip at the bank and say, you've all been really naughty. But in practice, as you rightly identified, this is an industry that necessarily takes a lot of risk. And if I say to you, look, Mark, I've got 10 quid, that's my tier one capital, could you lend me 90 quid, and I'm going to go out and invest hundred pounds in a series of risky assets and loans, how about it? You'd say, no, 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 I have far more capital on the table if I'm going to lend you any money at all. But actually we've all got used to banks having relatively small levels of reserves, relatively high levels of loans and lots of risky activities. London, of course, is the financial capital of Europe. It's the global leader in FX, in derivatives, all sorts of assets. But uh, is there a risk, James? And it, it's been highly touted that we'll lose 
some of the top banks, some of the top names. Of because course there's a risk. Of down. course there's a risk. Because if you were sitting in London and saying, look, guys, we can decamp somewhere else and we can maintain our structure as it is, and we think that's in the benefits of shareholders, or we can stay and we can be split up, it is absolutely the board's responsibility to maximize shareholder value in the context of the various different constituencies who are engaged in assessing where they want to be. And very clearly to me, there will be some banks who will say, actually, we want out of here. But London has established its position. It's hard for another city to build that up overnight, isn't it? Well, I think we need to distinguish between where you elect to, to position yourself for tax purposes, where you actually want to carry out your operations. So Philip Green has demonstrated very amply in the world of retail, you can keep your capital in Monaco and run your retail empire on the high street of the UK. There's no reason why the banks and principals should not follow that route, with huge cost to the Chancellor. Got to get a comment on the latest news we've had, breaking news, James, that the banks continuing to park their money overnight at the ECB at a record level. They're not lending it out, are they? That's what we want. That's what we thought would happen well, from this three-year three -year financing a couple of weeks ago. I think if people genuinely felt the banks would be back to normal business after such a short period when the crisis has never been fully resolved, they need to think much more clearly about what was going on. We are in a process of deleveraging that involves the banks but also involves consumers. The only players who have money at the moment are the big corporations, and of course many of them have excellent balance sheet strength. Governments don't have the money, and therefore I think that we're into a multi-year, probably a couple of decades of deleveraging before we can say that we're back to business as usual. James, thanks for joining us today. James Bevan, their Chief Investment Officer at CCLA Investment Management.